Father, I love the words that we say. God, that we are who you say we are. God, that we are your children. We are your chosen people. God, we are not forgotten. God, no matter how separated we may feel from the rest of the world, from our friends, from our family, from you, God, to know that you are our heavenly father and you want what's best for us. God, our story of, of songs that we sang today, of God, that you love us, you love us so much to die for us. And God, that your promises stand true, that you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God, no matter what circumstances we're facing, God, no matter what happens in our lives, God, you are our rock. You are our solid foundation on which we stand upon. God, we love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Amen. What a great song to uh, walk us and thrust us into God's word together. Thank you, uh, Hanson, and to all of our praise team. Um, and... Uh, what a, what a good day it's been so far. My name's Luther. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at City Church. Um, you know, I've wrestled for three decades with the oddity of my vocation. My life uh, is called to try to convince people of the reality of God. Um, and if there is a God, that God revealed himself to us in Jesus. And that's such a weird vocation. Maybe you don't think so. I think so. But when somebody asks you what you do, you get to say, I'm a nurse. I build fences. I am a pilot. Um, and I just, like, I say, I try to change people's minds. Um, that's pretty much what I do every day. Um, and so today, if you are not a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to follow him. Now, there's a part of me for which all of this seems so odd, uh, not just convincing of any God, but a certain God, a God who fractured history by showing up as a Galilean carpenter 2,000 years ago. And this is a mental hurdle for many people because they say things like, I believe in God, I just... I'm not sure about Jesus. Um, maybe he was a prophet, maybe he was a teacher, but I don't know if he was God. Well, when I was first introduced to Jesus and actually began to read Jesus in my high school years, what I read in Jesus was not exactly what I had seen and heard in his followers. There was a major difference between Jesus and his followers. Am I the only one that has noticed that? That there is a difference between Jesus and his followers? I want to tell you what the difference is. Uh, the difference is this. There is a genius to Jesus. There's a genius to Jesus. Everything I read that Jesus said, and at least the stuff that I could understand at the time... Everything I read that Jesus said made more sense than what anyone else was saying. And Jesus showed to me, and I think he showed all of us, a way of life with more meaning. That was more cohesive than anyone else. That the Jesus way of life is good for everyone. Even for those that don't believe it. Because Christianity is not a religion that's good only for Christians. Christianity is a religion that's good for the world. I'm talking to you today about the identity of Jesus. My journey brought me to a place where I realized it's only when we come to know who God is that we discover who we are. It's only when we discover who God is God in Christ, that we discover who we are. See, there is no true identity for a creature outside of the knowledge of its creator. You can imagine if a shrub in my yard could talk. Pick anyone. I've got lots of them that are near death. Um, but if it could talk, it would say this to you. It would say, I don't know where I am. 
I don't know why I'm planted in this yard. I don't know who I am or what I'm supposed to be doing. But if I could talk to the shrub, I could tell the shrub, I planted you. I went to the nursery and I picked you out. You rode in the back of my truck. I picked the flower bed for you to go in. I'm the one that determines how much water you drink. I'm the one that put pine straw around. In. I put you in my yard to be beautiful and green. And so it would then know who it truly is, wouldn't it? If the creature could hear from its creator. The way that, see, we try to engage people with Jesus is we try to offer them a better life, an elevated life, an upgraded life. And, and if you come to Christ, you know, we don't say this, but we imply, if you come to Jesus, you'll get better friends and probably a bigger house and a better job. And Jesus will help you put all the pieces of this wonderful life together so that when you post those vacation pictures and all of those holiday family pictures, everyone will know just how together you are and just how blessed you are. And you will love it. Other people will hate it, but you will love it. One thing, one thing you will notice as we study the book of Acts is that this is never the approach of the apostles. They never tried to convince any of their listeners that if they followed Jesus, it would massively improve their lives. And that's because they knew that would not be the case. That inviting people to follow Jesus, it meant a very good chance that it would shorten their life. And so they said, believe in Jesus, not because of what he will do for you, but simply because of who he is. We're talking about the identity of Jesus. So this brings us to Acts chapter 2, which I told you last week is a summary of the first Christian sermon ever preached. You say, Luther, how, how do you say it's just a summary? Well, if Peter preached it, it only took him about 90 seconds to preach it. And I can promise you Peter had more to say on that day than just 90 seconds. And so what a sermon it is. It's a confrontational sermon. This is not, you know, five ways to improve your life. This is the confrontation. This is a declaration of God in Christ. Now, this is a massive passage today. So I'm going to start in verse 22, and I'll kind of show you where to follow along as I read. Acts chapter 2. Peter says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Look down at verse 36. The conclusion. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus whom you crucified. Both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this. They were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles. Brothers what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 were baptized. It was a good sermon, and it was a good day, a wonderful, terrific, no bad sermon. Very good day. Early in my Jesus journey, I struggled with the many times, not all the time, but too many of the times, when I would hear someone speak publicly about faith and their intelligence level would have something lacking. And I know you're not supposed to say that, but that's how I felt. And 
it was as if to have faith meant giving up your intellect, that no intelligent person could possibly believe in a benevolent and omnipresent God. And I really did not want to be counted among the morons of the world. You see, if I'm real honest with you, I would have to tell you that for my entire life, I really wanted to be smart. I am captivated by higher intelligence. And now, I don't mean like Albert Einstein, Chase Logan kind of intelligence. <laughs> but, but regular, everyday, ordinary people who are brilliant. You know who these people are. And I came to realize when I was in school, I am not one of these people. And so I determined to make up the difference with hard work. And probably some posing, I'll admit that, because you know, when you wear glasses, if you take your glasses off like this, <laughs> you can even say really dumb stuff. But people will think you're smart just by posing that way. But I like to think that it was more hard work than anything else. My wife will tell you I would read any number of books that I had to read. I would study as long as I had to study. I would write and rewrite and edit a paper um, as many as times as I needed to to get it right. To this day, I have trouble finishing a sermon. It is never good enough. I am always working. And so when I came to faith, it brought me to this place of decision where I concluded, I guess, that if I'm going to embrace God in faith, then I also have to embrace this lack of intelligence toward life. But I was conflicted because at the same time, I believed with all of my heart that there was a genius to Jesus. And so I could not reconcile how Jesus and his vision for the world was so otherworldly and so brilliant. And yet, so many of his followers, including me, did not share those same qualities. But I could not deny the truthfulness that I saw in Jesus. I hope you're trekking with me. See, it's very difficult because you've all had this experience where some doofus TV preacher spouts off something on the evening news, and then people ask you, hey, do you believe what that guy believes? And you have to reluctantly admit, well, I mean, yeah, we're sort of on the same team technically. I mean, he comes to the reunion, but we don't sit at the same table. Why is it that ignorant people are always the most confident? Have y'all noticed that? <laughs> People who know the least are absolutely the most confident people in the world. Now, I've had the privilege of meeting some brilliant people. And one thing that all of them share is that they could not be more humble. It seems as if the more they learned, the more they were aware of what they're yet to learn. And the more they understand about the world, the more they come to understand that there's parts of the world in life that they don't understand but then you have these moronic goobers out there, and they cannot be convinced of anything. They stand boldly in their ignorance, and they refuse to listen to any other viewpoint than their own, which I guess is the definition of ignorance. So when I became a Christ follower, I did not want to be that. I wanted to be a thoughtful, sincere, and intelligent person who could speak about God wisely and not from a place of ignorance or a place of arrogance. Now, to do this, you cannot construct your faith on cliches or superficiality. You must wrestle with the hard stuff. You have to face the hard stuff. You have to face the stuff that you uh, don't want to face, the stuff that you don't want to do. And see, this is exactly what Peter's sermon does. It confronts us with hard truth. And I want to share with you four truths every person is confronted by in this sermon. Number one, 
We must wrestle with the identity of Jesus. The identity of Jesus. Verses 22 and 23. Peter tells us that Jesus was more than a myth of the early church. Now, some people simply cannot and do not believe in the Jesus of Scripture. But notice how Peter describes Jesus in verse 22. Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man. In other words, he's a man of history. This really happened. He really lived somewhere. He had a geography to him. He had a a, a story to him. He is not a creation of the early church. He's not a mythical creation like Pegasus or the moon landing. Um, He is Jesus. I'm just kidding, y'all. That's just for my own sake to say crazy things like that. The apostles constantly pointed to the concrete and factual realities of Jesus. How many times do you see them say, talk to his followers? Go talk to the eyewitnesses. We knew, we knew his parents. We know his parents. Are not his brothers and his sisters among us? What I find amazing about this is that even if Jesus is only an idea and the Jesus of history never existed, if Jesus is just a myth of the early church, that idea changed the way humans approach life more than any other idea that's ever existed. That's amazing, isn't it? That even if Jesus didn't exist, he still has changed the world more than anything else has changed the world. There's never been another idea that brought that kind of change. See, you can't just dismiss Jesus with that kind of an excuse. You have to wrestle with history. Jesus was more than a myth of the early church. But not only that, Jesus was more than a miracle worker. Although he did miracles. He says, he was accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. So when Peter is describing the miracle working of Jesus, he does so with a threefold description. He says, miracles, wonders, and signs. Now, in the language of the Bible, you often have a twofold description of something. You see it all over the place where Jesus will say, truly, truly, I say to you. And the truly, truly is a way of intensifying it. What he's saying is this isn't true. This is really true. So when you have a threefold description of something three times, we're really turning things up a notch, aren't we? And so when Isaiah has his vision of God on the throne, he doesn't say God is holy. And he doesn't say God is holy, holy. What does he say? Holy, holy, holy. It's the threefold description. This is the ultimate holiness. And so when we read of Jesus here, the the worker of miracles and wonders and signs, his power is stretched to no limits. There is nothing he could not do. And he did not do miracles to gain a following. History is replete with that tactic. History is full of miracle workers, and the story goes the same way every time. The longer they teach, the longer they lead, the more sensational their miracles become. But oddly enough, the ministry of Jesus doesn't work like that. The longer he ministered, the fewer miracles he did. And as we read the book of Acts, you're going to see early in chapters, there's a lot of miracles from the apostles. But the longer the story goes, the less miracles are physical and the more spiritual the miracles become in nature. And so you have to wrestle with the miracles of Jesus. He was not only more than a miracle worker and more than a myth, Jesus was more than a martyr, even though he was put to death. In verse 23, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Peter is saying that what happened to Jesus was not perchance. It was not the tragedy of a runaway train. It was part of the plan of God. William Barclay calls this the eternal paradox of the cross which at one time is the plan and purpose of God, but also happened at the unspeakable criminality 
of the hands of men. And so on the one hand, we have Jesus' horrible death by scrupulous, wicked people, self-righteous Jewish leaders who handed Jesus over to the wicked Romans in full knowledge of the brutal torture and execution that would take place. And yet, the early believers insisted that this is precisely what God had determined must take place. Because Jesus is not a martyr. He's not a martyr being defeated. He was a savior bringing victory. And when he spoke of his death, he spoke of the hour of his glory. And in John 10, he says, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. So who is Jesus then? If he's not a myth of the early church, he's not just a miracle worker, he's not a martyr, who is Jesus? And verse 36, Peter gives us that answer. He is both Lord and Messiah. Lord means he is the one who rules over your life. He's the one that you give your allegiance and your loyalty to, him and him only. Not the other kings, not the emperors, not the tetrarchs or the ethnarchs. And this was a really important word in the Gentile mission. And the other word he uses is Messiah. This is the one who has completed God's work of redemption. This is God's anointed one, the one in whom and through whom God has done his most special work. The crucified Jesus of Nazareth, Israel's Messiah, has become the risen Lord of the whole world. And so we must wrestle with the identity of Jesus. But not only that, number two, we must wrestle with the reality of the resurrection. Verse 24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You see, in the end, Christianity rests not on whether or not you like the teachings of Jesus. It rests on whether or not he rose from the grave. N.T. Wright says that the resurrection of Jesus presents evidence that demands an explanation by historians and by scientists. And he says the evidence is so powerful that you can't just dismiss it. You can't just dismiss it because it doesn't fit your paradigm. He said, instead, what you have to do is recognize that your old paradigm can't answer for this and realize that you need a new paradigm. The fact is, a new worldview exploded on the scene at the resurrection. Leo Tolstoy asked the same question when he was about 50. And he says he was brought to the verge of suicide for this one question, the most simple question, he says, lying in the soul of every person. And that is, is there anything in my life, anything of meaning in my life that death will not destroy? Is there anything that I've done, anything that I can do, anything that I can become that my death will not wipe away? And resurrection was the hope for that. Resurrection says death does not win. Death does not get the last word. When Tim Keller was terminally sick with cancer, one day he tweeted, if the resurrection of Jesus is true, then everything's going to be okay. The whole world renewed resurrection. The third thing that we have to wrestle with, we must wrestle with the fulfillment of of God's promises. Now, in verses 25 to 35, you have this, it's easy to get caught in the weeds because Peter quotes several Psalms. He quotes Psalm 16, Psalm 110, and he's talking about God's promised one, God's anointed one who will come and overcome death. And as Peter reads from these Psalms and comments on them, he's going to tell us, he's going to draw this profound conclusion that there is this one who will not be abandoned to the grave. There is this one who will not see decay. In other words, he will not die and his body start to rot. And yet Peter insists 
David cannot be talking about himself. Because we know that David died. And we know where David is buried. And so he must have been speaking of someone else. This Jesus. And what he's saying is that Jesus' victory over the grave was not God displaying how powerful he was, but rather it was the fulfillment of specific promises that God had made through King David. So Peter is saying to his audience, you have to wrestle with fulfilled scripture. When God says that it will happen, and 800 years later it happens, we can't just chalk that up to coincidence. We must wrestle with the truth. The fourth thing that we have to wrestle with, number four, is the testimony of the first followers. The testimony of the early believers, verse 32 God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see now see in here. See, the story of Christianity rests on the testimony of the first believers. Were they telling the truth? That's what you have to decide, and I have to decide. Were they telling the truth? Because they all wagered their lives that they were telling the truth and that Christ had been raised. They were so convinced that Jesus had been raised that every one of them spent the rest of their lives carrying that message. There is no, nothing nebulous about their response. Their response is crystal clear. They were convinced that something happened that had changed the world, and they had to go and tell the whole world about it. Let me ask you, has anything in your life ever happened that convinced you that the whole world had to know about it? Has anything ever happened that you thought, this is so important, I will give the rest of my life to telling people about this? Because those early believers did just that. Now, a little over a year ago, the greatest thing that's ever happened to a human happened to me. I became a grandfather. And I don't think that I have showed y'all one picture of him on a Sunday morning. I, I, now, I'm not going to say I have it, but it hasn't been more than one. I know I haven't done it twice. And yet, there is nothing I love more than that, but I don't wake up every day and say, I got to tell the world about Parker. I got to tell him what he did. Now, if you're in the family chat, you're going to hear that. They spent their lives telling the story. 11 out of 12 of the apostles went to their graves asserting that they had seen the risen Lord. And some of you may be saying, well, Luther, don't you think maybe they died for a lie? Isn't that possible? People die for lies all the time. I mean, you got kamikaze pilots and suicide bombers that think they're following God's will. But what's the difference? And the difference is that those apostles knew the truth. They knew whether or not They were lying. They knew whether or not they had encountered the risen Savior. And every one of them said, there is no doubt we have seen him alive. So verse 37 brings us to the heart of this. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the others, brothers, what shall we do? They were pierced in the heart And you may remember two weeks ago, the the people asked a question when the Spirit of God descended. They asked the question, what does this mean? And then Peter began to teach them what this means. And now they ask a second question, what shall we do? And those are two really important questions. What does this mean and what shall we do? 
And that helps us understand something about faith, that faith requires something of understanding. What does this mean? What do I need to understand? But then it also requires a decision, doesn't it? What shall we do? They've been confronted with the truths of Christianity, the identity of Jesus, the fulfillment of Scripture, the resurrection. Uh, they've, they've faced these things, um, and now they have to be responded to. And so I want to conclude and answer this question, what does it mean to respond to Jesus? In verse 38 is where we'll focus. It's one of the most important verses in the whole book of Acts. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is not a comprehensive statement of faith. It's not a comprehensive statement of conversion. I mean, this doesn't tell us the whole story. It's, it does not even mention faith here. And we know that faith is an integral part of conversion. But I want you to see that Peter mentions four aspects of conversion. Two things that we do and two things that God does. And it shows us how salvation is this beautiful mystery of the interwovenness of God's activity in our lives. And so, what does it mean to respond to Jesus? First of all, he says, we repent. We repent. That's a really important word. Jesus, John the Baptist, and Peter make the word repent, repentance, central in their preaching. When someone has that profound life change, that change of direction, that person who does not believe in God and does not honor God, when they become a person who believes and follows and worships, that is called repentance. Simply put, it means to turn to God, to turn to God, a life turn to God. And so it includes that, that we repent as a change of our minds. It's a paradigm change. It's a wake-up call for us. We think differently about the world. But not only that, we repent as reformation of our lives. We abandon sin. We abandon selfishness. We abandon all of the brokenness and toxicity of our lives. And we repent as a shift in our devotion. We abandon our former loves for our love of God. And so the first thing he says is we repent. The second thing he says is we are baptized. For the early Christians, baptism was their symbol of conversion. When you were baptized, you proclaimed to the world that you, number one, believe the gospel of Jesus. Number two, that you've repented from your sin. Number three, that you have confessed Jesus as Lord. Baptism was the declaration of a new creation, a new person. I'm washed, I'm clean, I've died to sin, I've been raised to new life in Christ. But I want you to notice something following each of these. Repent and be baptized, this little phrase, in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's the most important part. Because we make all kinds of changes to our lives. And our following Jesus isn't one in a long line of changes that we make. This is not the turning over of a new leaf. This is not near new year, new me. No, this is something that is wrought in us by the power of Jesus and for the power of Jesus. We are baptized. We turn our lives to God in Jesus. And he says, number one, God gives the gift of forgiveness. In salvation, we receive the gift of forgiveness. Now, Christianity has a lot to say about forgiveness, doesn't it? We can drown in everything that our faith says about forgiveness. But here is the point, and this is what you have to hold on to. At the cross, God dealt with our sin. At the cross, our sins are forgiven. At the cross, our lives are reconciled to God. So, if you're a note taker, here's the note that you need to write down. Sin is not so much the breaking of a rule, but the breaking of a relationship. You've got to understand sin that way. It's not the breaking of a rule. It's the breaking of a relationship. 
So how does that affect how we think about forgiveness then? So forgiveness doesn't mean the broken rule is made whole again, as if the rule is what's important. No, forgiveness means the broken relationship has been made whole again. You can imagine if you had children and one of your children rejected you for no reason at all except their own selfishness. And they would not speak to you no matter how much you pleaded. And so you decide to send one of their siblings to talk to them and tell them that you unconditionally forgive them. And you long to reconcile with them. And your child, they hear this, and they're just, they're overcome with joy. I mean, they erupt with joy and with gratitude. And they, they tell their friends, you know, I'm finally at peace with my parent. Finally at peace. I'm so overjoyed by this. And you invite them over all the time. But they always politely decline. And they never come. They never come and sit at your table. They never come and sit on the porch with you. And so the status of the relationship has changed technically. But that's not what it's about, is it? And yet... The way so many people have focused on the gospel, we offer people the good news of forgiveness of their sins, and what we mean is forgiveness for the rules you have broken, and yet they accept the forgiveness, but they never truly become a child of God who is reconciled to God in fellowship and worship. And that's all the difference in the world. And that's what we mean by the gift of forgiveness. It's a restored relationship. And the last thing that he tells us is that God gives us the gift of his spirit. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the book of Acts, you're going to read the words, the gift of the spirit, the coming of the spirit, the baptism of the spirit. Luke refers, these are all the same thing. This is the spirit of God coming to dwell in the life of a person at the moment of salvation. So there is no such thing as a believer without the Spirit of God. If you're a believer in Jesus, you have the Spirit of God dwelling and living within you. Now, there was a lady in Dillard's one time that accused my wife of just the opposite of that. She had a picture of some clouds, and she was showing everybody. And this lady could look in the clouds, and she could see the face of Jesus. And she's showing Trinity, and Trinity is studying, and she is squinting. And she is trying really hard to see Jesus in the clouds. And she finally says, man, I am sorry. I just can't make it out. And the lady says, well, it's probably because you don't have the Spirit of God. And at that point, I ran across the shoe department and got my wife out of there because even though the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, patience, and kindness, that was not what was about to come out of my wife's mouth. And I'm, I'm only kidding. Um, if those of you that know her know that she would never say anything like that, she would go to the car and cry and, uh, and ask me, do I really have the Spirit? I think I do. So here's what's amazing about this statement, though. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is what's amazing about it. That in the life of faith, God does not simply give you salvation. He gives you himself. He gives you himself. But Luther, do I really need Jesus? Aren't all these religions the same? I mean, don't they, don't they all lead to the same place? Well, actually, no. That's actually an incredibly condescending insult to every religion. If you go up to a Muslim and you tell them that they're basically a Buddhist, they believe all the same things, you will insult that Islamic person. And if you go up to a Buddhist person and tell them, you know, you're just a Christian, y'all all believe the same thing, you will insult the Buddhist person. It would be like saying, you know, saying every religion is the same is like saying ice cream and sushi are the same. They're both food. They're, they're the same. Well, Luther, I mean, all religions give you a path toward your ultimate fulfillment, toward your highest fulfillment, a path to ascend, to nirvana or heaven or shalom. Well, see, this is where Jesus doesn't qualify 
as a religion. Because Jesus did not come to tell us what the path is to get to God. He came to show us what God would do to get to us. God is the name that we use when we talk about us getting to God. But Jesus is the name we use when we talk about God getting to us. And if God were to ever do anything in history, he would be the proactive initiator of love. That everything he is is love. And everything that God does is love. And everything God intends is love. We are the ones who are broken. We need God. God does not need us. If God were in need of us, then let's go. Let's go find him. But we are the ones in need. We need him to find us. We are the lost ones. He was the one who came to rescue us. And so today, I want to invite you to follow Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And you're saying, I already have a life. And I think Jesus would say to you, that's not what I call a life. He would say, you exist, but existence and life is not the same thing. There's a difference Because Jesus doesn't come to just change our minds and change our beliefs. He comes to change our very existence. And I can tell you this. I, I don't even have to know you to be able to tell you this right here. I can tell you when you will feel the most alive in your life. When you will feel more alive than at any moment. It will not be when you are the most successful. That will not be when you taste life. It will not be when you are the most wealthy. It will not be when you are the most famous or the most powerful. You will feel the most alive when you are the most deeply loved. Because when you are the most deeply loved, even if you don't have success or wealth or fame or power, you will still have life. And Jesus says to us, I am what your soul has been longing for. And so today, I want to invite you to follow Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, your word, you tell us that it is bread. It is the bread of life that we take in. And Lord, sometimes it feels more like we're eating broken glass than bread. And it cuts us in deep places and it challenges us in the hard places. But Lord, it doesn't leave us that way. Because even as it breaks us down to our bare essence, Lord, it also transforms us into something we could never be left to ourselves. And so, Lord, I pray for anyone today that has come to that place of decision who would answer the question, yes, I want to follow Christ. And I thank you, Lord, for their repentance right now. I thank you for the turning of their life from themselves and turning their lives to you. And I pray that, Lord, that we would look forward to that day of celebration, of baptism, and, Lord, most importantly, the transformation that you bring because you bring forgiveness, and Lord, you bring yourself, and that changes everything. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We celebrate that, and we ask this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.